grateful that I was uh, allowed to come and speak to you because I wanted to say, first of all, I am not a Suzuki teacher. Um, I am the daughter of a mother who taught herself how to play the violin using the Suzuki books and other books from the library so that she could teach her children how to play the violin. So that's, that's what's so special about my mother who is here in this picture in California with grapes. So when my mother was a young girl, she moved with her family from Costa Rica to the United States. And the family lineage in Costa Rica included writers uh, and the first violinist in Costa Rica, Ismael Cardona was his name. This was a family of intellectuals who immigrated to find a better life. And my grandfather, who was a published writer, a yoga practitioner, an idealist and a leftist, became a janitor in Los Angeles. Yes. <clears throat> Well, we moved into an old house, a boarding house, in fact, and I discovered there was an attic. So I did go up there and found some records, some of them broken, some of them not. And one of them was the Beethoven Violin Concerto, played by Misha Elman, who I didn't know anything about. Well, from that day on, I was so moved by this music that, yes, that I decided I wanted to learn to learn, to learn the violin but I never did, so. <laughs> oh, many years later. Okay, uh, you so grew many, up. <laughs> sorry. Uh, so many years later, when I was already a mother, uh, we went to hear Dr. Suzuki, his first concert actually in Los Angeles, and um, we were just amazed like everybody else, when the little children came out to play. In fact, the first piece they played was the Eccles Sonata. Very beautiful. So he had brought all the children and gave a full concert. Well, the next day, <laughs> Vidana's father brought her a little violin. She was then two years and 10 months, and today that is 52 years ago. Uh, a little longer. Anyway, <laughs> this is the story of how we learned to play the violin together. My parents had tried to find teachers in Los Angeles for several years with some of my older brothers and sisters to start them on different instruments, including cello. But teachers at that time in the 1960s believed that if you waited until the age of 10, that you'd be able to catch up and it would be much easier to teach them. So they were very discouraged. Um, but I do have to say that we had a very obsessive house with music playing absolutely all the time. Um, there was Mozart, Beethoven, Rimsky, Korsakoff, and folk music was allowed. No other music, no popular music, but we were allowed to listen to Pete Seeger, Bob Dylan, etc. And uh, so this is what our, our lives were filled with. My turn. <laughs> uh, so the next day, Dilana's papa, as I said, brought her a little violin. And I showed it to her and I said, you know, this is your violin and I'm going to teach you how to play it. First, we're going to learn how to stand really beautifully and very comfortably. And now you're going to learn how to hold your violin. You're going to have a lot of fun playing the violin and soon we're going to learn to play Twinkle Twinkle. <laughs> later I said to Dilana, well the next piece I'm going to teach you is called Aunt Rody. go tell Aunt Rody. And you know she loved, Aunt Rody had a farm and she loved this old goose and found it dead in the mill pond. So it was a very sad piece to learn. <laughs> Can I just like go tell Aunt Rody? <laughs> ah, 
We played many songs together, and one of them was May's song. May's song is really exciting because I was born in May, so I really identified with this song. And I have to say that my mother was a really natural and brilliant emotional illustrator of these songs that I learned when I was little. I remember absolutely clearly inside of myself how I felt when I played each of these songs. So with May's song, I said, well, it's your song and it's full of flowers. There's something very tricky though in May's song. I'm going to show you what it's called a finger bridge. Your third finger, put your third finger on the A string then leave it down and move over, and then you come back to it. That is called a bridge. The next piece, a little later, Wait, let me play this. we're going to play is called Long, Long Ago. I want to play May song. Oh, May song. <laughs> it's my song. It's my love. Oh, that's right. Sorry. <laughs> It's called Long, Long Ago. Mama, how come I don't sound like the record? Well, that's because you have to learn to wrap your hand back and forth, and that'll produce a better sound, and it's called vibrato. This song is about a story that happened a long time ago, and your brother Ivan loves to dance when you play it for him. my brother this was uh, for long long ago he used to like to dance when I would play the violin and he emoted long long ago right there mm -hmm. so I love Halloween because of the scary piece called witches dance <laughs> so I told her the witches are dancing around the fire in this piece and you make a very special rhythm by stopping your bow it's called staccato something that later on when she was 13, 14, she wouldn't accept concerts around Halloween. Even with going to Spain, she said, no, it's Halloween, I can't. Well, Halloween is very special, very sacred in my house. <laughs> okay. So the, <laughs> yeah, my turn? Yeah, Happy Farmer, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> the next piece is called The Happy Farmer. And you have to imagine the farmer as he's planting the seeds, digging up the ground, and they begin to grow in the sun. When Delana was seven years old, wait, are you going to play Happy Farmer? It's a little no. tiny bit. <laughs> it was time for her to get a teacher and we took her 
I had taken her as far as I could, which was like the bottom double concerto, and it was very hard for me to keep up with her. So we went and found Manuel Kompinski, a very brilliant teacher in Los Angeles. So my first lesson with Mr. Kompinski, a uh, couple of years ago I found an old tape and I had it transferred and I listened to it. It was my very first lesson with Mr. Kompinski, 45 minutes, age of seven, G major scale, that was it. I have no idea how my mother had the guts to take me back to see him after that scale. It was an excruciating 45 minutes where he said, higher, lower, no, nope, higher, ah, do it again, one scale. The Bach, you say he taught you the Bach? Oh yes, he taught me the Bach A minor concerto was the first piece we played together. Yes. So I told Vigana that it was very natural to be learning a concerto to play it with orchestra. And so she did. With Mr. Kompinski's Scholes Orchestra, she played for the very first time the A minor with his orchestra. <laughs> So this is the great David Oistrakh, and my father was a, a, just a brilliant man who studied the books of Galamian and, um, and Leopold Auer and wanted to have, my parents did not want to be stage parents, so they took me to play for every great musician that they could find that came through Los Angeles to get feedback. So one of the people that I played for was David Oistrakh, and this is, what, this is one of the pieces that I played for him.
Nope, that was Eccles. Now, the Cinder Ballet. Another piece a lot of play. You went too far. No. Ricochet. Okay, here. Okay, we got it, we got it. <laughs> Another piece that Ilana played with orchestra was the Saint de Ballet, in fact, with the brother of uh, Jorge Bullet in Long Beach, California. And this piece has lots of technique that she really enjoyed doing, and including ricochet. So Mr. Kompinski taught me the Saint de Ballet, and he said that ricochet was gonna to be too difficult for me to learn, I was eight. And he said that we could do that part of the piece without the ricochet. But when I got home from the lesson, mom said, you know, in that Galamian book, I read about how to do ricochet. Uh, why don't you let me teach you how to do ricochet? <laughs> so, uh, hold on, here's some ricochet. movement of the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto. So I came to my mother and I said, listen, if I learn that first movement of the Mendelssohn Concerto in a week, could I have a monkey? For some reason, I, I had to have a monkey. <laughs> and I said, sure, you can have a monkey. I figured it would take her at least a month, okay? So it didn't, it, take, it took her about a week and we got the monkey. <laughs> I feel very bad about that now to this day, the, the, the terrible situation with the monkey and used to escape into the trees and we'd have to get the fire department to come and get the monkey down. Um, I started to learn the Tchaikovsky Concerto with Mr. Kopinski when I was 10. Here I am with my mother in Costa Rica, walking into the National Theater where I performed with the National Symphony Orchestra in Costa Rica, the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto. Thank mm -hmm. you.
after that, I went to take, uh, I went to my first master class with Nathan Milstein in Switzerland, and I began following him around the world when I could to uh, study with him. When I was 17, I traveled, there was me traveling on a train. <laughs> when I was 17, I went to the Tchaikovsky competition and where I won the silver medal. And then after I came back from the Tchaikovsky competition, a couple years later, I lost my violin that was loaned to me. It's a long story. There's a TED talk I did, you can read about that. It's not a story for today. But um, I wanted now to go into my, my teaching. So uh, I started teaching when I was 19. My first student was a, a wonderful little boy, three-year-old, and he's now a really brilliant uh, music documentarian who travels around the world. And I also secretly saw, taught some Juilliard students who weren't allowed to say they were taking lessons outside of Juilliard. Um, but um, what was very interesting back at this time in the, in the 70s for me when I was uh, teaching in the 80s is that there was lots and lots of discussion about bow hold. And in fact, when I lived in Bloomington, Indiana, uh, we used to have parties with other violinists and we'd argue about bow hold, whether that first finger should be uh, extended or it should be the Leopold Auer, uh, you know, Milstein hyphens bow hold with the fingers together. So we had many, many argumentative times over ping pong talking about the bow hold. But what I began to notice as I traveled and performed and, and did master classes around the country, um, was the increasing incidence of uh, tendonitis and shoulder problems, neck pain. Um, and I began, what, what started for me as a very natural approach to playing the violin, um, I began to have to really examine what I was seeing and how to help. Um, a lot of people started to come to me, even professionals, uh, seeing the way that I played and knowing that I didn't have any of these issues asking me to help them. So over a span of you know, 25, 30 years of teaching, um, I've worked with all sorts of problems and, and uh, uh, have in all, the, all of those years have taken off every single shoulder rest I have ever seen and have never had a shoulder rest failure removal. <laughs> but I learned many, many things about removing the shoulder rest and reteaching technique to students who, and, and uh, professional musicians. So I've had a lot of professional musicians who've come because of pain issues. For instance, um, a studio musician in Los Angeles who was unable to do long, long sessions because of neck pain. But my, my, if, I, if I just go forward a little bit to now, this girl kind of changed my life in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, she came to me because she had some serious neck pain and shoulder pain and was starting to develop some uh, elbow and left arm pain. And she was really thinking of giving up the instrument and didn't know what to do. And her teacher uh, had heard about me, you know, the specialist with pain, so sent her to come and we worked together. And in a couple lessons, she was fine. She didn't have any more issues. And here's just a little clip of her playing. <laughs> When I took her shoulder rest off, um, of course she had to relearn shifting completely and she had to relearn vibrato as well because without a shoulder rest when you shift a third position, you have to take your wrist forward because you need to help hold the instrument in third position with your left hand. Milstein used to say that he held the violin with his left hand. That was it. And in fact, he had the ability to play Paganini Caprices with his violin held against his chest I'm talking any Caprice, he knew all 24 and he played them, in, I mean, it was just unbelievable, but he could play them with the violin against his chest without even holding it underneath his chin. And, um, but it was not a long discussion with Milstein because nobody ever had a shoulder rest back then that we really saw. One time a girl named Christina from Germany came to the master classes in Switzerland and she had a shoulder rest and Milstein said, what's that thing, what's that thing you have there? And you know, she said, oh, it's my shoulder rest. And he said, take that stupid thing off. And he forced her to take it off. Of course, she couldn't play. How could she play? I mean, it's uh, unreasonable to say that somebody who uses a shoulder rest can take it off and play the violin. 
or what, what would make them think they could do that, you know? Um, so uh, this woman here, Cassandra Krondike, is the woman who sent me that young girl to study with me and um, invited me to come and start working with her students and some other students that were in a Suzuki program in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So I proceeded in the span of a year to take 53 shoulder rests off, uh, children from age 3 to 16. And um, I had a lot of very interesting experiences with these children. Uh, I'll show you later a little boy who was had only been uh, playing for six months. Uh, he was three and a half years old. And he was the most difficult child to remove off a shoulder rest. Um, here's Cassandra working with a, a young boy who started without a shoulder rest. So now at, our, at my school, the String Academy of Grand Rapids, all the children start without shoulder rests. And, um, and successfully so. Uh, this is a little girl who came off a shoulder rest and relearned her uh, vibrato. So these are these are some of the 53 kids that we took off the shoulder rest plan. <laughs> when I work with students who are um, uh, changing their technique is a couple of very important things to reduce uh, tendonitis. Uh, I used to teach at Interlochen uh, for several summers, the one they used to have their eight-week summers, and I became the, the tendonitis specialist. In fact, they, they asked me to give a talk about just tendonitis, and I talked about hand position, left hand position, uh, untwisting the hand, keeping the hand as open as possible, some details we can talk about. And I was fired after my session. They said, you can't talk. We want you to talk about ibuprofen or, or yoga or icing. And I said, you know, that's great for a temporary fix for a week or so, but you have to, you can't go back to the way you were playing. You'll just go right back to the tendonitis and problems. And the same thing happened when I went to the Heifetz Institute. Uh, Daniel Heifetz is a, a friend from Los Angeles. We grew up in Los Angeles together. And he invited me a couple, two, two times to go and perform at the Heifetz Institute. And then the second time I performed, gave master classes and was teaching. And afterwards he came to me and says, sorry, I can't hire you anymore because the other teachers are very upset about your uh, talk about the uh, shoulder rest and the left hand, you know, twisting, etc. cetera. Uh, but they did have, a, you know, a lot of tendonitis at Interlock and, and a lot of tendonitis at the Heifetz Institute. Um, this is another little girl. She had, this little girl had some trouble coming off the shoulder rest because her left shoulder, of course, with the shoulder rest is kind of pushed backwards a little bit. So getting her shoulder position just to slump forward and be relaxed, and because as violinists, we have horrible posture. We can't play violin with our shoulders back. We have to play with our shoulders a little bit slumped forward, embracing the instrument that way. And oftentimes I'll describe to students that holding the violin, you know, it's like hug a tree, you know, center your arms in a circle in front of you. And if you take your right arm and just turn it down and you take the left arm and turn it up, that's the tip of your bow. Um, but with a shoulder rest, often with shaped shoulder rests, I'm more talking about shape, not a small sponge, but a, an actual shoulder rest, the, the instrument is often taken off over the left shoulder, which means that to get to the tip of the bow, this arm has to really extend, this shoulder has to extend over. In fact, one of the, one of the longest discussions on violinist.com was one that I started, and the question was just, I'd like to do a little survey. How comfortable are you playing at the tip of your bow? Oh my God, within three days, there were 100 answers, they closed it down. People were saying things like, it's overrated to play at the tip. 
I never play at the tip. And I was thinking, wow, I mean, we only have this one little bow. We better use every, every inch of it. So this is um, this little girl, as I said, she had a little trouble coming off the shoulder rest, uh, readjusting. Um, she also, I also changed their hand position. As you can see, I use old Russian school where the fingers on the, on the bow hand are together because that's the way that I was taught and that's the way I have seen many Suzuki teachers teach and the way that I teach when I start students as well, which is to have the hand just simply fall and that's your bow position and not to extend the fingers because the more you extend them, the more you're activating tendons and muscles inside the hand. So for her, she had quite an extended finger um, bow hold and she also liked to play where when she would come with a down bow, she would send her wrist down. So there was a lot of wrist movement at that moment, up, down, up, down. And it made for a very jerky bow. And I remember Milstein describing to me, he said, you go up, you come down. What more do I have to say? <laughs> So one of the things I wanted to show you was actually how I um, I help reposition them. Oh, this is this is actually a very interesting case study. <laughs> Feel like a medical doctor here. So she also came off a shoulder rest, and um, you know it's very important to go back to book one of Suzuki, but the old book of Suzuki from the '60s, which is the one that my mother sent away for. And I don't know if any of you remember. There's a picture of a little girl in the front, uh, the, the, very, the very first picture, and um, it shows the alignment of the foot, the violin, the nose, and uh, this is something that I have to reteach every single child or even adult who's coming off the shoulder rest because this is something that's very unnatural. Well, what's been natural has been taught out of them. And one of the things that I had to work with her and some other students is the actual position of the head. Because I say to them, if it's not comfortable while you're washing dishes, you shouldn't play the violin that way. So I often have them freeze, take the violin away, and they realize their head is some, in some awkward position. And you know, it's very natural to turn your head back and forth, it's very natural to, to go up and down, but it's not good to do this. Maybe occasionally, but when you do this, you're really actually compressing uh, in, in your, your neck, uh, in your vertebrae in your neck. So pinched nerves can be a very big problem. In fact, a young girl came to me recently, um, she's a little older, she was 12, and she came from, moved to Grand Rapids from Chicago from a unnamed but very famous Suzuki school. And they use very, very high shoulder rests. And she moved to Grand Rapids, Michigan, where I live. Her uh, father had a job. And she developed terrible migraines and uh, white spots in her vision. And she went to our fabulous children's hospital that we have in Grand Rapids. I know it well. <laughs> and um, they ended up not knowing what to do. They ended up doing a brain MRI, trying to figure out what her problem was because of this severe pain migraines and blurred white, white spots in her vision. So her mother thought, I'll take her, read about me, pain specialist came to see me, and I fixed her in a couple lessons. She's never had any problems, nothing. She's perfectly fine. But anyway, I'm gonna play a little clip of this girl who, as I said, she had little problems coming off the shoulder rest. It really, you know, to be very realistic, it can take from three to six weeks. I mean, that's just what it takes. It, I've never seen anybody comfortable in, in well, one, one person, but most of the time it, it really takes a whole rearranging of, the, especially left hand shifting. Now, this was an interesting little girl because they get all sorts of interesting problems. Uh, I have a son who's now 25 years old and he has Tourette's syndrome. And there were times in his life that his Tourette's was so bad that he, he couldn't walk and I would have to carry him. And one of the things that my son had, as many Tourette's people had, was severe facial grimacing. And this little girl came to play for me the first time when she uh, switched and of course he took the shoulder rest off, etc. 
She had very severe facial grimacing. I thought she had Tourette's, so I didn't want to say anything until I knew her better. But I realized after the lesson and I was speaking to her and her mother, there were no signs of Tourette's in her normal conversation or in just walking and playing with the friends in, in the school. Uh, so in the second lesson with her, I, I needed to help her you know, relax all of her facial muscles so that she didn't have this really horrific grimacing. So I put a little piece of paper between her teeth and I called it the special paper. And we would put that between her teeth and I made her play that way. And within a couple, it took really two, maybe even three weeks of having that paper in her mouth during all of her practice sessions and playing for her to really relax. But here she is now. <laughs> So um, I, I have, uh, you know, a couple, what do I have here? Well, I have a couple other examples, but really at this moment, I think it might be interesting if I just open it up to you and if anybody has any questions, it might go in a different direction. Yes? Um, do you have anyone you've worked with that has had focal dystonia before and has gotten help with uh, taking the shoulder rest off if they've had one? I have had a person who had dystonia, but not vocal dystonia. I don't, I don't, I'm uh, not familiar with that. Well, Shoulder. Just, uh, focal dystonia. Oh, focal. I thought you said vocal. I'm no, sorry. Okay. No, I had a student who had dystonia, uh, something in their, their shoulder, and I also had a student who had frozen shoulder um, that I have worked with taking the shoulder rest off. And it's, it's actually, I think it's imperative because you need to get the position, um, you know, the spinal, the straightness of the spine and the, the straightness of the shoulders blocking off to the hips is very important. And when you have a shoulder rest, oftentimes this shoulder is either down or slightly back, which means that there's a little twist in the spine as you're playing. Uh, there's also a great distance here. So even if you only have a shoulder rest that's an inch high, by the time you get to the to where the, the left hand is, that lift is quite high. So getting around the instrument, even with a small shoulder rest, translates in this sort of triangle to be quite high for shifting. Um, so I don't know if that answered your question about dystonia, but I have I have worked with some pretty pretty serious issues. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Um, well, two things. I'll the first question was about the length of the neck. Um, I have never had in, in 35 years anybody who was unable to take a shoulder rest off. Um, I have had very skinny and very lanky. Uh, students, a couple of girls and a couple of guys that were quite, you know, six six one, but 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 very skinny six one, and with them I have what well, with one of them I thought impossible. There's no way he can play without a shoulder rest. So I tried, kept trying to put him on uh, like a couple pieces of rubber. He wouldn't have it, and he plays now without shoulder rest. He's, you know, very comfortable. I didn't think it could be done. I questioned myself because he was so tall and thin. I've had many people come to me and say to me, oh no, I could never play without a shoulder rest because I have a very long neck. And I look at them and go, it doesn't look so long to me. <laughs> you know? and, and so there's a lot of defensiveness. There's no question about that. Um, the left shoulder does need to support the violin. It's going to be, it's going to be moving. And this is an important part of feeling that the instrument is part of you and not that you're playing on a violin. Now, if you're going to shifting, the left hand cannot be free to shift. Shifting has to be, like Milstein said, like a snake movement. So when you take the shoulder rest off and you have to shift from first position to third position, you can't shift with your hand as a whole because the violin can slightly drop. So the, this thumb has to be released slightly to come forward and you are shifting on the thumb. The thumb is helping you slide. So as you go to third position, this is the shift and then you go back. So the thumb, as Milstein said, the thumb is like a snake back and forth. And I, I reteach this to all the students that I work with. And one, one, one way of helping them to learn that 
is to force them to shift by taking their chin completely off the instrument. So I say, okay, now try to shift, and they crawl themselves up. I said, ah, you see, so this left hand has to have some motion and movement. When you've been using a shoulder rest, you get very stuck in this hand position being always the same. The thumb is back, and the, the fingers are this way. Um, the other thing I, I reteach as well is to untwist the hand. So you want the hand to be as flat as much of the time as possible because this is comfortable, this is not. So I have to unteach hovering, you know, hovering over the strings, being ready to play. Um, you know, actually, one of my criticisms of hovering is that, and this is a very easy thing to, to, uh, to feel for yourself, which is if you take your hand and, you, and you, con you contract your fingers so they're curved, and you keep them like that, and now you try to move them fast. It's very hard because the muscles are already contracted, but if you allow the fingers just to be loose and you move them fast, you'll find that it's much easier to flap them because the, the muscles are loose. So this idea of hovering and being ready to play over the instrument has twofold problems. One is that it's twisting the hand because the pinky is always over the strings ready to play. Um, and the other is that the muscles are constricted. And so you're trying to move already a muscle that's con contracted. The muscle is contracted because the fingers are curved and then you're trying to move them quickly. And uh, so that, those are my two ideas about that. Yes. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, there was a time that I was personally concerned myself with that. And so what I did was I tried to encourage more sliding because I didn't want to get stuck into having a problem. Uh, I, I felt like I needed to go into confronting the violin sliding. So what I started to do was I started to use a scarf to make it more slippery. Yes. I have a different kind of question, and I'm not quite sure how to ask it, but I'm dying to ask you, so I'm going to ask it anyway. Go, do it. <laughs> you uh, played a recital at Stevens Point several years ago. Mm -hmm. It was one of the most electrifying recitals I've ever heard. Oh, thank you. It was reminiscent of Camilla Wick. It was just the kind of style of playing one doesn't hear very often. Thank you. And I've heard it in the echo. What, what goes through your mind when you're thinking? Well, I'll tell you, and, and this is why this talk, and I, I, my mom was tired and didn't want to come. I said, Mom, please, please, I so want you to come. You know, what my mother did when she, as I said, illustrated these early pieces for me, and the way she did it without, without exaggeration, but with such simplicity and honesty, uh, I absolutely remember Go Tell Aunt Rhody and the way it felt inside of me and how I tried to feel that as I played Go Tell Aunt Rhody when I was three years old. And this has grown, um, obviously, through, through repertoire. And because I started so little and because um, my mother's approach was always so completely natural, uh, even to the point of saying, oh, you're going to play with orchestra? Well, that's nothing. You're supposed to. The piece is written to be played with orchestra. <laughs> you know, so, um, and, and also another, another element that was given to me very, very early was that music is to be given. And my role as a musician is to give this music to others. It's not about me. It's about giving. And I'm the conduit for, for that to happen. And that brings a tremendous amount of humility, um, I think. Um, and when I am playing, I, I almost, I feel a combination of being completely who I am and very honest with how I'm feeling about this expression of, of what's, what the music is allowing me to, to uh, touch into um, and as well getting out of the way. So it's kind of a combination. Hmm. Yes. Uh, what you're describing is so similar to Baroque violin playing. Have you done any Baroque playing with that creepy crawling? Uh, no, no, but I have read about um, uh, Baroque violinists who don't use chin rests and, and have a high thumb and, and play with a relaxed wrist back and forth. But uh, no, I haven't done it myself. I would call it creepy crawling. Uh -huh. 
Yes, yes, it makes sense. Yes. Like that today, <laughs> yes. And the other question is: Have you had any uh, done anything with kind of Hobbit? I remember her book early on, and I remember reading it, and I was probably in my twenties. Um, but no, I, I don't really have experience with her. Yeah, there's lots of these people would come to her. Yeah. Yes. She was a very natural poet, so I think she didn't have a phobia. Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh, it's absolutely connected. I mean, where the position of the instrument is and how you're able to pull your bow arm is, is interconnected. It's not, it's not separate at all. So what I was talking about before, that if you're talking about a very shaped high shoulder rest, which has the, the shoulder uh, curve to it, most often that pulls the violin over this way, more perpendicular to your body, which then means that the bow arm, instead of being, you know, Milstein was very interesting, and if you watch um, black and white, uh, there's some fabulous videos of Milstein where you can really see his bow. You see the natural arc of the bow, which is the natural arc of the arm. Um, you know, I, I always teach my students how to play a straight bow. It's absolutely critical that they learn how to and then forget all about it. But they have to learn how to do it straight first. But Milstein always talked about changing the bow, for instance, at the tip using shoulder muscles in the back. So, for instance, um, so there's the natural arc of the arm and changing the bow using the back muscle here. Milstein was very against um, using finger muscles to change the bow, and he told an interesting story. <clears throat> So again, going back to the fact that we used to discuss bow arm more than anything because nobody had a shoulder rest, um, he used to talk about how this idea of using the small fingers and the small muscles of the right hand to change the bow is being very dangerous because there's small muscles trying to make a very small movement. And he said he knew an eye surgeon, this back in the you know, 60s or 50s or whatever, said he had a friend who was an eye surgeon, and when they would have to make an incision in the eye, they would use a very heavy uh, scalpel that had a wooden, like a ball, and they would make the incision in the eye using their bicep muscle, because they had more control using the bicep muscle than to try to use the little tiny muscles to, to cut into the eye. So Milstein used to very much disagree, uh, his approach to disagree with this. Because you're using a lot of small muscles to make a small movement. Instead he said, go up, come down. And that would... <laughs> so we have time for maybe, you know, one, one last question. Yes? So if you take out the shoulder rest, do you do anything with the chin rest? Often. Yes, often. And what I do, when I take off the chin rest, I don't know where they're going to go with their chin rest, but I want them to be able to center, like, like Suzuki said, your eyes, your nose, to be able to look down your instrument without doing this, with the eyes sunk that way. I often get students who come to, you know, start out like this. I say, okay, stand up straight, now look over there. I said, see how long you can hold your eyes looking over there. And in you know four seconds, they can't do it. I said, but you're playing the violin like this. So um, what I do for them is I, I take off the chin, the chin rest as well, and the shoulder rest, and I, I build up some rubber, just very flat, like shelf lining rubber from Walmart or, no, I don't go to Walmart. I never Target. go to Walmart. Uh, I mean, Target. Target. <laughs> now, I don't know why I said Walmart. I never even go there. I don't believe in them. Anyway, so I make it very, very flat with maybe a slight ridge here so they feel like there's something. And let them, you know, loosen their heads up and loosen their whole approach so that they can reassess. And then later find a, a chin rest, Off, often a middle chin rest. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much.